Section 1 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. June. What is so rare as a day in June, than if ever come perfect days? Yes, Lowell, in a few words, describes the month of June, or at least he indicates something of it. But still, what are perfect days? We look for them in April, when the bird, many of them, certainly the most attractive of them, return from the south. When we find ourselves, when we visit the woods and parks, disappointed that the sun does not shine, that the air is not soft and balmy, and that the grass and leaves and buds do not show themselves in spring attire, for, on the contrary, we find winter lingering distressingly near, that the merry warblers are silent, and that the greenery of young nature is very slow to indicate her presence or even her early coming. We pull our wrappings about us and go home. April passed. We then fancy that her older sister, May, beautiful and literary imagery, for do we not recall descriptive visions of May days of long ago, when the human blossoms danced about the maypole, lulled luxuriantly in the soft, tender grass, hid themselves in the deep-leaved trees, and at last gratified her imaginations with the belief that she is altogether perfect? Unfortunately, a chill takes possession of us, and we return home disconsolate. May also has disappointed us. We have had an experience which we shall not forget. We have seen and recognized many birds, but they have not sung for us. They have been, as they almost always are, influenced by the elements. And why should they not be? They have but one suit of clothes. Have you observed the robin? In the early spring he is worth watching we watched a fine specimen in south washington park in march last it was a comparatively mild day for the windy month he perched on a lateral limb of a leafless tree a few yards from sixtieth street whether he saw us or not we could not be sure as he took little notice beyond saying to tut to tut he ruffled his suit and seemed as fat as feathers can make him it seemed as important to him as our buffalo robes to the slaying parties of a few days before. Still he was observant, and seemed to be looking for stray food that would warm him up. We had some fresh crackers in our pocket, which we broke into fine fragments, and scattered, withdrawing several yards away. To our surprise, not only a robin, but several nathatches, some brown creepers, a number of English sparrows, three or four blue jays, and a gray squirrel, from whence he came I could not conceive there being no large tree near in which he might have had a winter home, came with great promptitude to feed on the unexpected offering. Others, no doubt, have had this experience. Does it not suggest that the birds which remain with us the whole year round, finding, of course, during the spring, summer, and fall, sufficient for their wants, should be looked after a little bit, if only that they may be permitted to escape from the sometime unusually severe storms of winter? Nature has provided them with ample feathery protection from our ordinary moods, but when she breaks out in icy blasts and snow that covers the very face of her, they suffer and they perish. But April, with its weather uncertainties, although it has long been said and believed that its showers bring May flowers, with its disappointments to all those who wish that the balm of mild breezes would come, longed for by the invalid and the convalescent, the lover of nature who would go forth to visit her and to court her. April seems a sort of humbug. And is May much better? How many days, so calm, so sweet, so bright, the bridal of the earth and sky, come in May? A few do come, and we remember them. But, as Lowell says, perfect days are rare, even in June, when, if ever, come perfect days. We think that Lowell, nevertheless, lived a little too far north to entitle him to state, even poetically that perfect days are only to be enjoyed in june had he with the writer lived in southern ohio on the little miami river and gone fishing in the month of may he would we think have changed his mind or had he read the little less than perfect poem of w h menabil which it may be however was written later than the verses of r many think greatest poet june on the miami he might have put aside his books and his criticisms and his philosophy and sought out the beautiful river of western history and the sweetest stream that flowed in america and even now notwithstanding the giant sycamores have largely disappeared and the waters of the river have greatly diminished in volume leaving only holes and ripples and modified his views of days perfect only in june 
There were perfect days in May on the Miami. There were perfect days on all the streams that made it. The birds were multitudinous. They sang in chorus. They were, indeed, almost infinite in number, for the naturalist and the collector were unknown. The birds were natural residents, without fear of man, building their nests close to his habitations. A year or two ago, we stopped off the cars in May in order to recall, if possible, in the shadow of a few remaining trees at a familiar place on the vanishing river, the expected voices of the well-known native birds, the delightful far-gone years. Barely we had our reward, but it was not satisfactory. It seems to us we should do our best, through legislation and personal influence, to protect and multiply the birds. C.C. Marble End of Section 1「Section two of Birds Volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight read for LibriVox org by Alan Mapstone Our Neighbor We've a charming new neighbor moved in next door. He is hardly new either. He's lived there before. I should think he has come here two summers or more. His winters he spends far away. He is handsome and stylish, most fine to behold, in his glossy black coat and his vest of bright gold. He is proud of his feathers, so I have been told, and I half believe what people say. His wife is a beauty, he's fond of her too. He calls her his Judy. I like it, don't you? And he sings every day all the long summer through, yet he is not a bit of a bore. For he's a musician of wonderful power. I could list to his beautiful voice by the hour. And he sings to his wife in their green shady bower, In the elm tree that shadows my door. He's a sociable neighbour, we like him full well, Though we've not called yet and cannot quite tell All he says, though his voice is as clear as a bell, And as sweet as the notes of a psalm. Do you ask what his name is? Our dear little Sue was anxious to know it, and asked him it too. And this was his answer, I'll tell it to you. My name is Sir Oriel, ma'am. L.A.P. in Our Dumb Animals End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Avai in November 2020. Birds' Nests The Nest of the Morning Dove The nest of the Carolina or Morning Dove, which authorities place on the horizontal limb of a tree, is not always found in this situation, as I can testify. Last year, while wandering in early May through a piece of low woodland in Amherst, Massachusetts, my eye was caught by a pair of well-grown youngsters covered with bluish pin feathers. The nest containing them, a loose affair of small sticks and leaves, was placed on the ground, or rather on the decayed base of a stump, surrounded by a ring of second-growth birches. Immediately suspecting their identity, I merged myself in the landscape after the manner of bird-lovers, and was soon rewarded by a sight of the parent doves, who came sweeping down from a neighbouring tree, uttering their pensive call-note. The pair had been frequent visitors about the lawn and driveway for a few weeks previous. I have heard of another similar instance of ground nesting on the part of wild doves. Dora Reed Goodale. Wrens. That clumsy little bunch of animated feathers, the wren, is undoubtedly the most contented of dwellers on the face of the earth. In country or city, he is never homeless. Anything hollow, with an aperture large enough to admit his jaunty little self, is sufficient and so long as it remains undisturbed, he is a happy tenant. The variety of sights selected by this agile little creature is greater than that of any other bird. It has been said that a wren will build in anything from a bootleg to a bombshell, and this seems to be true. 
many an urchin can testify to having found the neat nest of the wren in his cast-off shoe or a tin can and nests filled with wren eggs are frequent finds in odd places around the battlefields of the south the home of a wren a few miles from petersburg virginia furnishes the strangest case in the matter of queer habitations yet discovered this country is the site of one of the most dramatic epochs of the civil war and frequently the bones of unburied soldiers are picked up recently a rusty old skull was found in which one of these wrens chose a shelter the skull when found was hidden in a patch of shrubbery the interior of the one-time page was carefully cleaned out and nestled in the basin of the bony structure was the birthplace of many a baby wren the skull made a perfect domicile a bullet hole in the rear formed a window an eyeless socket was the exit and entrance to the grim home it is easy to imagine that many a family feud had its origin in the desire of others to possess so secure a home i have myself says a w anthony of san diego california watched cactus wrens in new mexico carrying grass and thickening the walls of their old nests in october for winter use and have found them hidden in their nests during a snowstorm in november but there is another trait in bird nature that i have seen very little of in print that of building nests before or after the proper season seemingly for the sole purpose of practice or pastime the outcropping of an instinct that prompts ambitious birds to build out of season even though they know that their work will be lost end of section three this recording is in the public domain section four of birds volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight recorded for librivox dot org by phil schempf brunix myrrh this species which inhabits the coasts and islands of the north atlantic and eastern arctic ocean and the atlantic coast south of new jersey has the same general habits as the common myrrh which like all the ox myrrhs and puffins is eminently gregarious especially in the breeding season davy says that tens of thousands of these birds congregate to make their nests on the rocky islands laying single eggs near one another on the shelves of the cliffs the birds sit side by side and although crowded together never make the least attempt to quarrel clouds of birds may be seen circling in the air over some huge rugged bastion forming a picture which would seem to belong to the imaginary rather than the realistic they utter a syllable which sounds exactly like myrrh the eggs are so numerous as to have commercial value and they are noted for their great variation in markings and ground color on the farallon islands where the eggs until recently were collected for market purposes the myrrhs nest chiefly in colonies the largest rookery covering a hillside and surrounding cliffs at west end and being known as the great rookery to observe the egg gatherers says an eyewitness is most interesting as an egger climbs his familiar trail towards the birds a commotion becomes apparent among the myrrhs they jostle their neighbors about the uneven rocks and now and then with open bills utter a vain protest and crowd as far as possible from the intruder without deserting their eggs but they do not stay his progress and soon a pair then a group and finally as the fright spreads the whole vast rookery take wing toward the ocean in the distance perhaps we see suspended over a cliff by a slender rope an egger gathering the eggs from along the narrow shelves of rock seeming indifferent to the danger of the work all this is now changed the authorities have intervened to prevent the wholesale destruction of the eggs the western gull however is another enemy of the myrrh the california species it carries off and devours both eggs and young mr bryant says the gull picks up a myrrh's egg bodily and carries it away in its capacious mouth but does not stick his bill into it to get hold as is stated by some writers whose observations must have referred to the eggs already broken by the gulls or eggers 
the eggs of brunix myrrh cannot be distinguished from those of the common species they show a wonderful diversity of color varying from white to bluish or dark emerald green occasionally unmarked specimens are found but they are usually handsomely spotted blotched and lined in patterns of lilac brown and black over the surface end of section four this recording is in the public domain section five of birds volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the canada goose just a common wild goose of north america in the spring and fall you will see great flocks of us flying overhead an old gander in the lead crying honk honk as loud as he can our nests are only simple hollows in the sand on the shores of lakes and rivers around which are placed a few sticks and twigs the five eggs laid on a layer of gray down you're a goose that's a polite way some people have of calling another stupid but there are geese and geese as well as men and men i am going to tell you about one goose that dearly loved her master and considering the way he treated her you may conclude she was a stupid goose after all well this particular goose took such a fancy to her owner that she would follow him about like a dog even to the village where she would wait outside the barber's or other shop which he might enter people noticed this and instead of calling the farmer by his proper name began to speak of him as mr goosey this angered the man and he ordered the poor loving goose to be locked up in the poultry yard shortly after he went to an adjoining town to attend a meeting in the midst of the business he felt something warm and soft rubbing against his legs he looked down and there stood his goose with protruding neck and quivering wings gazing up at him with pleasure and fondness unutterable the people about shouted with laughter which so enraged her master that seizing his whip he twisted the thong of it about the poor bird's neck swung her round and round and supposing her dead angrily threw her body out of the window a few days after mr goosey was seized with a severe illness which brought him to the verge of the grave he recovered however and was able at length to sit beside the open window there on the grass sat the goose gazing up at him with the same old look of affection in her eyes am i never to be rid of that stupid thing he cried but when he was told that all through his illness the faithful bird had sat there opposite his window scarcely touching food his hard heart melted and from thenceforth mr goosey treated his feathered friend with the greatest kindness end of section five this recording is in the public domain section six of birds volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the canada goose the canada goose steering north with raucous cry through tracts and provinces of sky every night alighting down in new landscapes of romance where darkling feed the clamorous clans by lonely lakes to men unknown north america at large is the range of this magnificent bird common wild goose and gray goose are its other names and by which it is generally known the canada goose is by far the most abundant and universally distributed of all north american geese and in one or other of its varieties is found in all the states and territories of our country except perhaps florida and the gulf states in texas however it is plentiful during the winter months according to hallock although by far the greater portion of wild geese which pass the winter with us go north to breed still in suitable localities young are reared all over the united states from north carolina to canada they nest in the wilder parts of maine and are especially numerous in newfoundland near the secluded pools and streams so abundant throughout that island there remote from man they breed undisturbed on the edges and islands of the ponds and lakes the geese molt soon after their arrival in the spring and says hallock owing to the loss of their pinion feathers 
are unable to fly during the summer or breeding seasons but they can run faster than a man on the marshes or if surprised at or near a pond they will plunge in and remain under water with their bills only above the surface to permit breathing until the enemy has passed by they feed on berries and the seeds of grasses both the old and young become enabled to fly in september and as soon after that as the frost affects the berries and causes the seeds of the grasses on the marshes and savannas to fall to the earth or otherwise when the snow falls and covers the ground they collect in flocks and fly off to the southern shores of the island and from thence to the gulf of st lawrence where they remain until december and then assembled take flight in immense flocks to the southern parts of america to return in the spring the canada goose also breeds in great numbers on the mississippi river in which region it often places its nest in trees choosing generally a cottonwood stub not more than thirty feet in height the young are said to be carried from the nest to the water in the mother's bill as are the young of the wood duck sea birds volume two page twenty one the wild goose is often domesticated and in many portions of the country they are bred in considerable numbers when these birds return south at the commencement of winter they are generally very thin and poor being quite worn out by their long journey they soon recuperate however and in a short time become fat and are delicious eating a full and excellent account of the method of capturing the canada goose may be found in hallock's gazetteer end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of birds volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shreya The Brown Creeper I'm not a showy-looking bird like my friend the woodpecker, but my habits are something like his, and so is my tail. He uses his, you know to aid him in climbing trees, and so do I. They call me the creeper because I am always creeping over the timber in search of insects. If you ever see a brown-streaked little fellow, resembling a wren, traveling up a tree in short stages, now stopping to pick out an insect lurking in the crevices of the bark, or returning head downwards to pounce on an unwary fly, that is your humble servant, the brown creeper, up again you will then see me creep just like a little mouse uttering now and then a low plaintive note clear to the top i go exploring every nook and cranny never using my wings once last summer a little boy in the park wanted to get a good look at me so he very slyly crept up to the tree which i was exploring thinking perhaps that i was too busy to notice that he was there but i did see him for we little birds have to be always on the watch against our human as well as feathered enemies so i just stood still and peeked out at him from the other side of the tree very slyly then he moved around to that side and very slyly did i move around to the other keeping the tree trunk all the time between me and his bright blue eyes he's playing hide and seek with me mamma he shouted and so pleased was the little fellow that it was quite a while before I flew away. Like the woodpecker, I prefer a hole in a tree in which to build my nest, but instead of boring I look for a tree that has some of its bark loose enough for me to squeeze in. I line it with dry grass, moss, and feathers, and see to it that the overhanging bark shelters me and my four or six white, red, speckled eggs. End of section 7. This recording is in the public domain. Section 8 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Paul Harvey. The Brown Creeper. A little mite of a bird is this pretty creature. 
which many observers claim is seldom seen, or indeed is known to few, besides the special student of ornithology and the collector. We venture to assert that any one with fairly good eyes can see it almost any day, creeping over the timber in search of its insect food. Besides seeing it in the deepest woods, we often notice it in the open places and parks, and in gardens and orchards it is quite common. It commences operations at the foot of a tree, and travels upwards in short stages, now stopping to pick out an insect, lurking in the crevices of the bark with its long, slender bill, or returning head downwards to pounce on an unwary fly. Up again it creeps, more like a mouse than a bird, occasionally uttering a low and plaintive note, right to the top of the tree it mounts, exploring every nook and cranny likely to reward its search as it goes. Now it creeps on the underside of a projecting limb, then again on the top, and although it will explore an entire tree, still it but rarely uses its wings to convey it from one part to another. You will also find that it, like the woodpecker, endeavors to be on the opposite side of you and carry on its explorations unseen. Curiosity, however, often seems to get the better of the creeper, and you will see its light-colored breast and sharp little head peep trustfully at you and again vanish from sight. The creeper is admirably adapted to its ways of life. Its bill is formed for obtaining its insect food, and its tail supports it while climbing. The brown creeper nests in early summer when insect life is most abundant, and like the woodpecker, prefers a hole for the purpose. This it lines with dry grass, moss and feathers, and makes a very warm and comfortable home. The eggs are from five to eight, white, spotted and speckled with red. The creeper is not migratory, and we see it in the woods throughout the year. It is hardy and lives sumptuously the winter through. One who was very fond of the little creature said, If the swallow were to visit us at this time, it would undoubtedly perish, for the air in winter is almost clear of insect life. But the little creeper can live in ease when the sun is at Capricorn, just because he can climb so dexterously, for the bark of trees abounds with insects, and more particularly their eggs and larvae, which lie there torpid until called into life by the general presence of the vernal sun. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Paul Harvey. Section 9 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jen Broda. The Downy Woodpecker. Another woodpecker? Yes, there are such a tribe of us, you know, more than you can count on your fingers and toes, as my cousin, the red bellied woodpecker, said in the February number of Birds. The word toes reminds me that I am not of the three-toed fellows he was so anxious to tell about. I have four, as you see, two before and two behind, so have most of the woodpeckers. Should you be looking out for me this summer, you will recognize me by my four toes, the white band down my back, and the two white stripes on the side of my head. My tongue you can't see, but it is small, flat, short, and horny, armed along the edges with hooks. When I catch an insect, I do it by throwing my tongue forward out of my mouth. I have an idea the insects consider my treatment of them rather rough. If I didn't eat them, the wood-boring ones would destroy all the trees. My bill isn't strong enough to bore into the hard wood. I only injure the bark, no matter what some people may say. The wood-eating beetles, caterpillars, spiders, daddy-long-legs, grasshoppers, and flies are all grist for my mill. Or bill, rather. I like beech nuts, too, when I can find them. I'm the smallest of the woodpecker family, quiet and unobtrusive, they say, in my manners. 
I am sociable, however, and go about a great deal in the company of other birds. Mr. Nuthatch, Mr. Brown Creeper, Mr. Titmouse, and Mr. and Mrs. Wren are my especial friends. Can I drum? Indeed, yes. I wouldn't belong to the woodpecker family if I couldn't. All I need is the stub of a dead limb whose center is hollow and whose shell is hard and resonant. I will drum on that with my bill for an hour at a time, stopping now and then to listen for a response from my mate or a rival. Early in the spring, we downies pick a hole in a dead tree, or in a post or rail off of a fence, in which we lay four, five, or six glossy white eggs. Sometimes it takes us a whole week to chisel out that hole, and we are so busy that a little boy or little girl can get very near without our minding. End of section 9. This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898, recorded for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. The Downy Woodpecker Every leaf was at rest, and I heard not a sound, save a wood drummer tapping on a hollow beech tree. This little woodpecker is the smallest of all those inhabiting the United States. In the shade trees about houses and parks, and especially in orchards, he may be frequently seen tapping or scratching on the limb of a tree within two or three yards' distance, where he has discovered a decayed spot inhabited by wood boring larvae or a colony of ants, his food consisting of ants, beetles, bugs, flies, caterpillars, spiders, and grasshoppers. The late Dr. Glover of the Department of Agriculture states that on one occasion, a downy woodpecker was observed by him making a number of small, rough-edged perforations in the bark of a young ash tree. And upon examination of the tree, when the bird had flown, it was found that wherever the bark had been injured, the young larvae of a wood-eating beetle had been snugly coiled underneath and had been destroyed by the bird. Beech nuts also constitute a considerable portion of the food of this bird. Dr. Merriam says that in northern New York, they feed extensively on this nut, particularly in fall, winter, and early spring. This miniature woodpecker is very social in its habits, far more so than other species, and is often found associated with other birds in the woods, the orchards, along fence rows, and not infrequently in the cities. He is often seen in company with the white-breasted nuthatch, see Volume 2, page 118, and the brown creeper, Volume 3, page 214. Early in the spring, the downies retire to the woods to make their nests, preferring the vicinity of running water. The nest is begun about the second or third week in May and consumes from two days to a week in building. The holes are usually excavated in dead willow, poplar, or oak trees, and the height varies from 4 to 30 feet, generally about 15 feet. The entrance to the nest is about 2 inches in diameter, and the depth of the nest hole varies from 8 to 18 inches. The eggs are 4 or 5, rarely 6, and are pure glossy white. We know of no more interesting occupation than to observe this bird. It is fond of drumming on the stub of a dead limb whose center is hollow and whose shell is hard and resonant. Upon such places it will drum for an hour at a time, now and then stopping to listen for a response from its mate or of some rival. At all times it is unsuspicious of man and when engaged in excavating the receptacle for its nest, it continues its busy chiseling, unheeding his near approach. The woodpecker is wrongfully accused of boring into the sound timber, and by letting in the water, hastening its decay. As Dixon says, alas, poor harmless unoffending woodpecker. I fear that by thy visits to the trees thou art set down as the cause of their premature decay. Full well I know thy beak, 
strong as it is, is totally incapable of boring into the sound timber. Full well do I know that, even if thou wert guilty of such offense, nothing would reward thy labors, for thy prey does not lurk under the bark of a healthy tree. Insects innumerable bore through its bark and hasten its doom, and it is thy duty in nature's economy to check them in their disastrous progress. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 11 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Auntie Bacon, Dahlonega, Georgia, 2020. The New Tenants by Eleonora Kinsley Marble. And now the little wrens are fledged and strong enough to fly. Wide their tiny wings they spread and bid the nest good-bye. Such a chattering as greeted Mrs. Wren when she returned with a fine black spider in her bill. All the children talked at once. Bobby alone never uttered a word. "'You naughty boy!' exclaimed Mrs. Wren, turning to the crestfallen Pierre. "'Did I not tell you to take care of your brothers and little sister? The idea of trying to fly before you have had a lesson! I have a good mind to whip every one of you!' And the irate Mrs. Wren very unjustly did indeed peck every little head sharply with her bill. Bobby cowered in the nest, much too frightened to whimper or even mention the injury to one of his legs, which he had sustained in his fall. Mr. and Mrs. Wren the next day proceeded to give the children a lesson or two in flying. "'My tail is so stubby,' wailed Emmet at the first trial. "'It brings me right down to the ground.' "'So doth mine,' lisped little Dorothy. "'Death wish I had no tail at all, so I do.' at which the others laughed very heartily. Bobby made a heroic effort to do as did the rest, but at the first movement sank back into the nest with a cry of pain. "'Such fortitude!' exclaimed Mrs. Wren when it was found one of his legs was broken. "'Not a whimper has the little fellow made since his fall. How heroic! How like my dear, dear papa!' And Mrs. Wren laughed and then cried from mingled pity and joy. "'Hm,' commented Mr. Wren. If Bobby had remembered the motto I gave them before I left yesterday morning, this accident wouldn't have happened. Can you repeat it? Turning to the eldest of the brood. Be sure you're right, then go ahead, shouted Pierre, totally forgetting he had not heeded the rule any more than Bobby. Yes, a safe rule to go by, said Mr. Wren, gravely stroking his chin with one claw. Dear, dear, ruefully examining the injured limb. Now the child will go stumping through life like his grandpa. I only hope, with a dry cough, that he'll not turn out a rowdy and lose one eye, too. "'He just set scars who never felt a wound,' loftily replied Mrs. Wren, who seemed never to forget a quotation. "'For my part, I'm proud that one of my boys should turn out to be such a spirited little fellow. But there, Mr. Wren, the children are calling you from that bunch of weeds over yonder. Go down to them while I fetch a nice canker-worm for Bobby.' After a few days, the lame Bobby was able to leave the nest and go hopping around with the other children, adding his feeble chur chur to theirs. Mr. and Mrs. Wren led them from one place to another, always among the weeds and shrubbery where they were soon taught to earn their own livelihood. Moths, butterflies, gnats, flies, ants, beetles, and bugs constitute our bill of fare, said Mrs. Wren as they went whisking along, together with thousand-legged spiders and worms. If we didn't eat them, they would destroy the fruits in their season. So you see, my children, what valuable citizens we are in the world. At nightfall, Mr. and Mrs. Wren with their brood flew to the crotch of a tree, and in ten seconds every little head was under a wing, and every little wren sound asleep. Well, said Mr. Wren one day, the children are old enough now to take care of themselves, and we must begin, my dear, to build a nest in which once more to begin housekeeping. "'It will not be in an old tin pot this time,' replied Mrs. Wren, with a toss of her head. "'And furthermore, Mr. Wren, I intend to have entirely new furniture.' "'Of course, of course,' assented her mate. "'Who ever heard of a wren raising a second brood in the same nest? "'We are much too neat and nice for that, my dear.' "'We,' sniffed Mrs. Wren, ever ready for a quarrel. "'I'd like to know, Mr. Wren, what you had to do with building the nest. "'I would, really. Humph! and Mrs. Wren flirted her tail over her head and laughed shrilly. "'I brought the first sticks, my dear,' he answered mildly. "'And didn't I do all the house-hunting? Besides, 
I forgot to tell you that when looking about in April, I found two other apartments which, if the tin pot had not appeared suitable, I intended to offer you. In order to secure them, I partly furnished each, so that other house hunters would know they were not to let. Humph! returned Mrs. Wren, though exceedingly well pleased. I'll wager we'll find a sparrow family in each one of them. No, we won't, chuckled Mr. Wren, for the houses I selected were much too small for Mr. and Mrs. Sparrow to squeeze in. "'You clever fellow!' exclaimed Mrs. Wren, pecking him gleefully with her bill. "'I am proud of my hubby. I am indeed.' And Mr. Wren laughed, and hopped about, never hinting to his innocent spouse that all the gentlemen Wrens did the same thing every year. The next day, while preening their feathers and getting ready for a visit to the apartments Mr. Wren had spoken of, a cry of distress smote upon their ears. "'That sounds like our Dorothy's voice,' said Mrs. Wren, her little knees knocking together in fright. "'It is Dorothy, calling for help,' assented Mr. Wren. "'I left the children in the orchard. "'Come, let us fly over there as quickly as we can.' "'On the ground, under some bushes, they found huddled their frightened group of little ones, "'while above on a limb of a tree perched Mr. and Mrs. J, "'uttering at intervals their harsh cry of, "'J, J, J!' "'It's our Bobby!' cried Mrs. Wren, aghast, after she had counted her brood "'and found one of them missing. "'Look at him fighting over there with that young J. "'That's it!' "'Give it to him!' screamed the delighted Mr. J. to his young son. "'Hit him in the eye, my boy! Hit him in the eye!' Mr. and Mrs. Wren flew about Bobby, uttering cries of distress. "'Fair play! Fair play!' cried Papa J., flying down almost upon Mr. Wren's back. "'Give the young ones a chance!' or a loud sharp twitter from the tree top caused Mr. J. to glance up. "'My old enemy!' he exclaimed, his crest falling at once as a low crown encircling a pompon of orange-red showed itself among the green branches. That tyrant Mr. Kingbird, he's always meddling in other people's affairs, he is. I'd like to wring his neck. Come, Mrs. J., come, my son, he screamed, and off they flew to boast of the victory among their neighbors. I hope your little boy is not much hurt, said Mr. Kingbird, rather pompously. I arrived just in the nick of time, I think. Oh, my Bobby, wailed Mrs. Wren, wiping the blood from his face. That dreadful J. has scratched out one of his eyes. "'How did it happen?' sternly inquired Mr. Wren. "'Tell me the truth, or—' Dorothy interrupted her father with loud sobbing. "'I—I I was flirting,' she stammered. "'Just a little with young Mr. J., Papa. "'You know how handsome he is, and bold. "'When Bobby steps up and he says—he says—' "'Well, go on, my little miss,' said Mr. Kingbird, deeply interested. "'What did your brother say?' "'He said, wiping her eyes with the corner of her wing, "'that birds of a feather flock together, "'and a girl with such a grandpa as I should be ashamed to associate with the son of a robber "'and a coward like Mr. Blue Jay, and so—' "'And so young Mr. Jay pitched into me,' interrupted Bobby, "'and I pitched into him. "'I'd have licked him too, Pop,' he added, flourishing his crippled leg, "'if his old pa and ma hadn't come up when they did and told him to hit me in the eye. "'A chip off the old block, ma'am,' said Mr. Kingbird, "'who had heard of Mrs. Wren's fighting papa. "'A chip off the old block, I see. "'Well, good day, all, good day, as your son wisely says—' "'Birds of a feather flock together, and it wouldn't look well, you know, "'for a person of my aristocratic appearance to be seen in such humble company. "'So good day, good day,' and off the pompous feather flew, "'leaving Mr. and Mrs. Wren decidedly angry, though grateful. "'Another week found the pair building a nest in the cavity of a maple tree "'near the study window, to the sticks and straws which Mr. Wren had placed therein early in the season.' Mrs. Wren added spider-webs and cocoons, lining the nest or furnishing it, as she called it, with horsehair and the downiest goose and duck feathers she could procure. There, said she, when all was completed and the first egg laid, Mrs. John can't sneer at our home now. No coarse chicken feathers or stable straw this time, Mr. Wren. We will use the other apartment you choose for the third brood, for we are to have three this summer as well as Mrs. John. When we go south in November, our family, I intend, shall be as large as hers. Mr. Wren made no answer, but possibly being such an uncommonly wise bird, inwardly marveled over that imperious force, that wonderful instinct which made it necessary for them and all the feathered tribe to reproduce their kind. Very carefully one winter's day Bridget removed the nest from the tin pot and, breathing it in ribbons, hung it above her chest of drawers in the attic. "'It do same,' said she to the children who prided themselves upon their knowledge of the looks and habits of the house wren, that in slow doin the birds this summer i do be after learnin a lesson i wasn't expectin myself at all a lesson said they curiously indeed it's young ye air my darlints to be thinkin of the same but sure it's not myself that'll ever be forgettin the patience ingenuity industry and conjugal love of the wee pair 
Faith, but it was a purty sight. Dumb animals, indeed. Never spake to me a dumb animals, for be St. Patrick if them two blessed little crathers didn't talk, scold, make love, and sing in a language all their own. Then me grandfather's name wasn't Dennis, and I'm not Bridget O'Flaherty at all. At all. The End End of Section Number 11 Recording by Auntie Bacon, Delonica, Georgia, 2020《Section Twelve of Birds, Volume Three, Number Six, June 1898. Recording by Auntie Bacon, Delonica, Georgia, 2020. Section Twelve of Birds, Volume Three, Number Six, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. The Old Squaw Duck. Here is an instance where the female is the head of the family indeed, for by common consent the name includes the male of this species. It has numerous other names, however, as Old Wife, South Southerly. Long-tailed duck, swallow-tailed duck, old Injun, Massachusetts and Connecticut, old Molly, old Billy, scolder, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. The habitat of the old squaw is the northern hemisphere. In America, south in winter to nearly the southern border of the United States. It is distributed throughout the northern portions of the globe, but makes its summer home in Arctic regions. George Harlow Clark, naturalist, Perry Polar Expedition, in a recent article mentioned that in June the old squaw's clanging call resounded everywhere along shore, and the birds themselves were often perceived gliding to and fro amid the ice cakes drifting with the tide between the main ice flow and the land. It is a resident in Greenland and breeds in various places in Iceland. The nests are made on the margins of lakes or ponds, among low bushes or tall grass, are constructed of grasses and generally, but not always, warmly lined with down and feathers. The eggs are from six to twelve in number. In the United States, the long tail is found only in winter. Mr. Nelson found it to be an abundant winter resident on Lake Michigan, where the first stragglers arrived about the last of October the main body arriving about a month later and departing about the first of April, a few lingering until about the last of the month. The word south, south, southerly, which some have fancied to resemble its cry, and which have accordingly been used as one of its local names, did not, to the ear of Dr. Brewer, in the least resemble the sounds which the bird makes. But he adds that the names old wives and old squaws as applied to this species, are not inappropriate, since when many are assembled, their notes resemble a confused gabble. Halleck says that most of the common names of this duck are taken from its noisy habits, for it is almost continually calling. Mr. E. P. Jacques asks in field and stream what has become of our waterfowl, assuming that their numbers have greatly diminished. The answer is a simple one. He goes on to say, they have followed conditions, take away their breeding and feeding grounds, and the birds follow. Bring back their breeding and feeding grounds, and lo, the birds reappear. For the past five years, waterfall have been about as scarce in the Dakotas as in Illinois or Indiana. The lakes were dry and conditions were unfavorable for them. In the spring of 1897, the lakes filled up once more. For the most part, the bottoms of the lakes were wheat stubbles. This furnished food for the spring flight, and thousands of birds nested there. When the wheat was gone, the aquatic growth took its place, and for every thousand ducks that tarried there in the spring, ten thousand appeared in the fall. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. The White Faced Glossy Ibis. Ibises, of which there are about 30 species, are distributed throughout the warmer parts of the globe. Four species occur in North America. According to Chapman, they are silent birds and live in flocks during the entire year. They feed along the shores of lakes, bays, and saltwater lagoons, 
and on mud flats over which the tide rises and falls. The beautiful, lustrous, white faced, glossy ibis inhabits the southwestern United States and tropical America. It is found as far north as Kansas and west through New Mexico and Arizona to California. In southern Texas, it is very abundant, and in some localities along the banks of the Rio Grande, swarms by the thousands. Dr. J. C. Merrill in May visited a large patch of tool reeds growing in a shallow lagoon about 10 miles from Fort Brown, in which large numbers of this ibis and several kinds of herons were breeding. The reeds grew about six feet above the surface of the water and were either beaten down to form a support for the nests or dead and partly floating stalks of the previous year were used for that purpose. Dr. Merrill states that it was impossible to estimate the number of ibises and different herons nesting here. Both nests and eggs of the ibises were quite unlike those of any of the herons and could be distinguished at a glance. The nests were made of broken bits of dead tools supported by and attached to broken and upright stalks of living ones. They were rather well and compactly built, quite unlike the clumsy platforms of the herons. The eggs were nearly always three in number and at this date were far advanced toward hatching. Many of the nests contained young of all sizes. The walk of the ibis is quiet and deliberate, though it can move over the ground with considerable speed whenever it chooses. Its flight is lofty and strong, and the bird has a habit of uttering a loud and peculiar cry as it passes through the air. The ibis was formerly invested with sacerdotal honors by the ancient Egyptians, and embalmed and honored after death with a consecrated tomb, in common with the bull and the cat. The bird probably owes its sacred character to the fact that its appearance denotes the rising of the Nile, an annual phenomenon on which depends the prosperity of the whole country. The food of the ibis consists mostly of mollusks, both terrestrial and aquatic, but it will eat worms, insects, and probably the smaller reptiles. The sexes have similar plumage, but the female is smaller than her mate. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Some Lovers of Nature. Our Musics in the Hills. Emerson. The groves were God's first temples. Bryant. Nature, the vicar of the Almighty Lord. Chaucer. The liquid notes that close the eye of day. The nightingale. Milton. When spring unlocks the flowers to paint the laughing soil. Bishop Heber. O oh, for a seat in some poetic nook, just hid with trees and sparkling with a brook. Lee Hunt. By shallow rivers, to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. Christopher Marlowe. To me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. Wordsworth. To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks a various language. Bryant. And this one life, exempt from public haunt, Finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Shakespeare. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel song that makes the heavens be mute. Coleridge. There is a pleasure in the pathless woods, there is a rapture in the lonely shore, there is society where none intrudes. By the deep sea and music in its roar. I love not man the less, but nature more. Byron. In June tis good to be beneath a tree, While the blithe seasons comfort every sense, Steeps all the brain in rest, and heals the heart, Brimming it over with sweetness unawares, Fragrant and silent as that rosy snow, Wherewith the pitying apple tree fills up, And tenderly lines some last year's robin's nest. Lowell. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 15 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. The Arkansas Kingbird. One of the difficulties of the scientific ornithologist is to differentiate species. This bird is often confounded with the flycatchers, and for a very good reason, its habits being similar to those of that family. It is almost a counterpart of the kingbird, see Birds, Volume 2, page 157, possessing a harsher voice, a stronger flight, and if possible, a more combative, pugnacious spirit. It is a summer resident, is common in the western United States, and occasionally a straggler far eastward, migrating southward in winter to Guatemala. Colonel Goss, in his History of the Birds of Kansas, one of the most comprehensive and valuable books ever published on ornithology, says that the nesting places and eggs of this species are essentially the same as those of the kingbird. They are brave and audacious in their attacks upon the birds of prey and others intruding upon their nesting grounds. Their combative spirit, however, does not continue beyond the breeding season. They arrive about the first of May, begin laying about the middle of that month, and return south in September. The female is smaller than the male, and her plumage is much plainer. Mr. Kaiser, in Birdland, tells an interesting story which illustrates one of the well-known characteristics of the kingbird. One day in spring, he says, I was witness to a curious incident. A red-headed woodpecker had been flying several times in and out of a hole in a tree, where he or she had a nest. At length, when he remained within the cavity for some minutes, I stepped to the tree and rapped on the trunk with my cane. The bird, bolted like a small cannonball from the orifice, wheeled around the tree with a swiftness that the eye could scarcely follow, and then dashed up the lane to an orchard a short distance away. But he had only leaped out of the frying pan into the fire. In the orchard, he had unconsciously got too near a kingbird's nest. The kingbird swooped toward him and alighted on his back. The next moment the two birds, the kingbird on the woodpecker's back, went racing across the meadow like a streak of zigzag lightning, making a clatter that frightened every echo from its hiding place. That gamey flycatcher actually clung to the woodpecker's back until he reached the other end of the meadow. I cannot be sure, but he seemed to be holding on to the woodpecker's dorsal feathers with his bill. Then, bantam fellow that he was, he dashed back to the orchard with a loud chippering of exultation. Aha, he flung across to the blushing woodpecker. Stay away the next time if you don't fancy being converted into a beast of burden. Eggs, three to six, usually four, white to creamy white, thinly spotted with purple to dark reddish brown, varying greatly in size. End of section 15. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Kelly Park. Queer Relations An English terrier, despoiled of her litter of puppies, wandered around quite inconsolable. A brood of ducklings one day attracted her attention. Notwithstanding their quacks of protest, she seized them in her mouth, bore them to her kennel, and with the most affectionate anxiety, followed them about, giving them, in her own fashion, a mother's care. When the ducklings at length took to water, her alarm knew no bounds. You dreadful children, her sharp barks seemed to say when they returned to land, and taking them in her mouth, bore them one by one back to safety, as she thought, to the kennel. The ear following, when again deprived of her puppies, she adopted two cock chickens, rearing them with the same care she had bestowed upon the ducklings. Their voices, however, when they grew older, greatly annoyed her, and by various means their foster mother endeavored to stifle their crowing. A hen that had selected an unused manger in which to lay her eggs and rear her brood found that the barn cat had also selected the same place in which to pass her hours of repose. The hen made no objection to the presence of Mrs. Tabby and vice versa, so that a strong friendship in time grew up between the two. Things went on very smoothly, the hen placidly sitting on her eggs, 
while Mrs. Tabby came and went at will, spending at least half her time beside her companion, as friendly as though she were a sister cat. Vainly did the hen sit, vainly did she turn her eggs. All the warmth in the world would not have hatched a chick from the stale eggs beneath her. Mrs. Tabby, however, had better luck. To the hen's amazement, she found beneath her very nose one morning five squirming, furry little creatures which might have been chicks but were not. Certainly they were young of some sort, she reflected, and with true motherly instinct, she lent her aid to their proper bringing up. The kittens thrived, but unfortunately, when still of tender age were deprived by death of their mother. All but one of her offspring found comfortable homes elsewhere, and that one received the devoted attention of the hen during the whole of that summer. To see it going between the house and barn, clucking for the kitten, says Dr. Biedner and our animal friends, was indeed a funny sight and quite as remarkable to see the kitten run to her when she made the peculiar call that chickens understand means something to eat. At night and during the resting hours of the daytime, Kitty would crawl under the warm wings of her foster mother, and the brooding hen and her nestling kitten were happy and contented, little dreaming and caring less that they were so far from being related to each other. End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Recorded for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. One Audubon Society. Five hundred invitations were sent out for a novel reception by the Wisconsin Audubon Society a while ago. One of the directors lent a large, handsome house and six milliners were invited to send hats unadorned with aigrettes or birds. Ostrich plumes, quills, and cocktails were not disbarred. Twenty-five other milliners applied for space. Everybody went, and a great many tastefully trimmed hats were sold. People who had never before heard of the Audubon Society became, through the newspaper reports of the affair, greatly interested in its object and the society itself greatly encouraged through the fact that by their hats and bonnets many of the best people of milwaukee were ready to proclaim it no longer good form to wear the blooms or bodies of wild birds certificates of heartlessness a writer in our dumb animals calls them and we know of no better appellation to apply women of fashion says the same writer have been urged to use the power which they possess and it is a power greater than that of law to bring this inhumanity to an instant stop the appeals for the most part were in vain birds continue to be slaughtered by millions upon millions simply for the gratification of a silly vanity of which intelligent women should be ashamed whole species of the most beautiful denizens of field and forest woodland and shore have been almost or quite exterminated songbirds have been driven further and further from the dwellings of men our country is stripped of one of its least costly and most charming delights and all that women may deck themselves in conformity with a fad a bill for the protection of birds was passed on march twenty fourth by the senate of the united states introduced into the house of representatives on march twenty fifth and referred to the committee on agriculture it is entitled an act for the protection of song birds we confess says the same writer to a feeling of humiliation when reading this bill because it seems a great indictment of the women of America on a charge of willful, wanton, reckless inhumanity, that such legislation should be made necessary through vanity alone ought, in our estimation, to bring the blush of shame to every good woman's cheek. I didn't think, 
is the usual reply of the fair sex when approached on the subject i didn't think i you didn't think but that plea can no longer avail when press and pulpit in the name of humanity so earnestly and eloquently pleaded with you to spare the birds if compassion for the little creature whose life went out in agony to supply that ornament above your brow does not move you to abstain from wearing such in the future then the knowledge that some of the best people in the country consider it bad form perhaps will e k m the lady has surely a beautiful face she has surely a queenly air the bonnet had flowers and ribbon and lace but the bird has added the crowning grace it is really a charming affair is the love of a bonnet supreme over all is the lady so faultlessly fair the father takes heed when the sparrows fall he hears when the starving nestlings call can a tender woman not care susan e gammons are dumb animals End of section 17. This recording is in the public domain. Section 18 of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Youth of Buddha from The Light of Asia in mid-play the boy would oft-times pause letting the deer pass free would oft-times yield his half-won race because the labouring steeds fetch painful breath or if his princely mates saddened to lose or if some wistful dream swept o'er his thoughts and ever with the years wax this compassionateness of our lord even as a great tree grows from two soft leaves to spread its shades afar but hardly yet knew the young child of sorrow pain or tears save as strange names for things not felt by kings nor ever to be felt but it befell in the royal garden on a day of spring a flock of wild swans passed voyaging north to their nest places in himala's breast calling in love notes down their snowy line the bright birds flew by fond love piloted and devadatta cousin of the prince pointed his bow and loosed a wilful shaft which found the wide wing of the foremost swan broad spread to glide upon the free blue road so that it fell the bitter arrow fixed bright scarlet blood gouts staining the pure plumes which seeing prince siddhartha took the bird tenderly up rested it in his lap sitting with knees crossed as lord buddha sits and soothing with a touch the wild thing's fright composed its ruffled vans calmed its quick heart caressed it into peace with light kind palms as soft as plantain leaves an hour unrolled and while the left hand held the right hand drew the cruel steel forth from the wound and laid cool leaves and healing honey on the smart end of section eighteen this recording is in the public domain section nineteen of birds volume three number six june eighteen ninety eight Recorded for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. Summary Brunix Murr, Uria Lombia. Range, coasts and islands of the North Atlantic and Eastern Arctic Oceans. South on the Atlantic coast of North America to New Jersey. Nest, on the bare rock, often on the narrow shelves of cliffs. Eggs, one. Canada Goose, Branta canadensis other names common wild goose gray goose honker range north america at large nest of dried grasses raised about twelve inches from the ground 
has been found in trees eggs generally five of a pale dull greenish color brown creeper certhia familiaris americana range eastern north america breeding from the northern border of the united states northward nest in holes of trees lined with dry grass moss and feathers eggs five to eight downy woodpecker dryobates pubescens other name little or lesser sapsucker this however is a misnomer range northern and eastern north america and sporadically the western portions colorado utah nevada california etc nest in an excavation in a tree eggs four or five rarely six pure glossy white old squaw duck clangula hyamalis other names south southerly long-tailed duck swallow-tailed duck old injun massachusetts and connecticut old molly old billy scolder new hampshire and massachusetts range northern hemisphere south in winter to nearly the southern border of the united states nest on the margins of lakes and ponds among low bushes or low grass warmly lined with down and feathers eggs from six to twelve of pale dull grayish pea green white-faced glossy ibis plagatus autumnalis range tropical and subtropical regions generally rare and of local distribution in the southeastern united states and west indies nest of rushes plant stems etc in reedy swamps on low bushes eggs three rather deep dull blue arkansas kingbird tyrannus verticalis other name arkansas flycatcher range western united states from the plains to the pacific and from british columbia south through lower california and western mexico to guatemala nest on branches of trees in open and exposed situations six to twenty feet from the ground built of stems of weeds and grasses eggs three to six white thinly spotted with purple to dark reddish brown End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds, Volume 3, Number 6, June 1898.